Um, I'm Ronan Anclo, and I'm here to talk to you about uh, POA version 3, and how we are trying to bring tools to help the DBA making informed decisions about how to optimize uh, a database. Um, so let's just start by presenting myself a bit. Uh, I would first like to apologize for my accent. So if there is anything you can't understand, please just ask me to repeat it. I won't be offended. Uh, so I'm a DBA at Dalibo, and I'm also a small time contributor to PostgreSQL. And um, I worked on uh, another open source project in the Postgres community, which is Multicon, which you might have heard about. And this project has also been written by my colleagues at Dalibo, Julien Rouault, which is right among us, and uh, also Marc Cousin and, uh, and Thomas Rice. So what is this tool for? This is a tool that was initially designed as a load analysis tool. Right now, with this uh, third version, it's also able to suggest optimizations, basically index suggestions, because that's something that we need to care about because as a DBA, if you don't know the application in detail, it's a bit hard to know what's missing. Especially if you're managing a large amount of databases or clusters. And uh, what's interesting about this tool, um, in comparison to others like log analyzers, like PG Badger, for example, uh, is that you can, you can see the activity of your database live. You don't have to produce a report when you want to see what happens. So how does that work? To provide metrics and then to provide suggestions on how to uh, optimize your database, you have to collect those metrics. So POA is based on um, maybe a bit intimidating application st stack composed of PGStat statements PGStat Kcache, PGQualstat, POA Archivist, and POA Web. The one that, you, that I assume you all are familiar with is PGStat Statements. The other ones are mostly Postgres extension and POA Web, which is a web interface to display all those results and make you those amazing suggestions to improve your database. So let's start with PGStat Statements. It's an official PostgreSQL contrib. What's interesting about it is that it will record every query that is played against your database in a normalized form. What does that mean that it's normalized? It means that the parameters are not in the query itself, but if you execute uh, select ID from customer where customer ID equal two, and then you perform the same, the same query with a client ID equal three, in PGSAT statements, you will see that the query will have been executed twice despite the parameter being different. And it provides you with uh, a range of cumulative counters, like how the data is accessed in the buffers or outside the buffer in the operating system cache, or the file system if there is a cache missing the OS cache. And you can group those results by user, by database, and by query. So what you can get, the useful bit of information you can get from <coughs> this extension is the number of queries executions for every different query and the average execution time, how many temporary files were created, what was their average size, and uh, what is the IO profile of your query. Uh, the problem with that is that it's only cumulative counter, so you have to take a base uh, reference count at some point and then compare it to another value at a later point. Because if you just act activate PGSAT statements and let it run for six months, well, you will just have a number of uh, accumulated statistics for six months and no idea what happened at a specific point in time. So PGSAT statements is used in the web interface uh, primarily to provide you with a query Runtime statistics. Um, you can think about it as a load, as an SQL load for your server. That means how many different um, how many different queries were executed at a time. 
uh, at the same time. The other really interesting information is the block access, where you can see if the block set were accessed by a query or aggregated in a database or aggregated by a role, are uh, read from the shared buffers or from the system. And so we provide various views of seeing those metrics with the runtime, the average runtime, and the block access. That's all useful information you can find nicely presented in the web interface. Um, the second extension, this one is actually optional if you want to use uh, BOA. Um, it's pgstat kcache. It's another Postgres extension that you can install. It's available on GitHub and uh, it's quite easy to install. And it has quite a bit of uh, an overhead, but it allows you to measure things at the system level. So you can get metrics like the physical disk access and the CPU usage. The physical disk access is actually quite a big deal because when you have a hit ratio in Postgres, you only know that you access the block inside or outside the shared buffers, but you have no idea if you actually reach the disks at that point. By using that, you can know if your read was performed in the OS cache or if the operating system had to read from your actual storage. And so we use that in the interface to provide you with a detailed hit ratio where you can see the shared buffer hit ratio as, and the system cache hit ratio and the actual storage hit ratio. That's a bit of information that's uh, mostly missing when administrating Postgres database. And you can also have the CPU usage for your queries. So let's say you're running a PostGIS uh, PostGIS instance, you can actually get by query or by database what, what are the parts of your applications that consume the most CPU. That's another bit of information that's quite uh, interesting to have because if you just use PGSAT statements, you have the raw numbers, but you have no idea if that time was actually spent um, at the CPU level or, at the, um, or in system code. The third extension that is also optional, but is quite useful, is pgqualstats. pgqualstats is a bit like pgstat statements, but it digs to another level, where pgstat statements aggregate statistics by queries. pgqualstats goes right through the where clause. So for each where clause, or even another predicate used in a joint condition, for example, we will collect stats for this. So what can we collect for, uh, what kind of statistic can we collect uh, for, for a predicate? We are collecting the selectivity, that is how many times, what you see in, a, in an explained plan when you see that uh, a predicate filtered a certain amount of rows, we are recording this information in PGQual stats, so you know that your predicate was executed maybe one million times, and it's only ret returned one tuple because there was only one tuple that satisfied the condition. We also do constant sampling. That is, when you write a query with uh, where client ID equal one, we are going to record the constant values that are the most often executed. The constant values that are the most filtering and the constant values that are the least filtering. This is really important to get some kind of insight into the real loads that your database has. For example, if you're using uh, um, a command processing system, maybe your application is constantly querying the, the orders that are actually not processed yet. And you will have executed select, se select something from uh, your table where state is processed Maybe uh, you will query that two or three times, but uh, where state is pending, that's really the hot part of your application that you want to optimize because that's where your real work is done. And that's something that, as a DBA, it's quite difficult to get this information if you don't really know the application. If you don't have a developer to really explain to you the business logic and what happens, it's quite difficult to get this information. 
even with log analyzers like pgbadger or something like that, you have only the normalized queries. So you have actually no idea how often the different values are executed. Uh, because this is done at the query level. It's not, it's not analysis done uh, on the data. It's done on yeah. the query, on the execution. It's, yeah, it's statistic gathered from the executions of queries. Just like PGSTAT statement, but at another level. And yes, for each one of those predicates, we also record how many times they were executed and what type of evaluation it was. Was it a predicate evaluated as part of an index scan or was it something that was evaluated after a sex scan, for example, while doing a sex scan? So what's the use for this? The use for this is that we can, you can actually know that you're constantly querying the same columns with maybe you're constantly looking for customers by name and you can get that insight from your actual load and then you know that, oh, well, my application is constantly querying on this column, maybe I should create an index on this. We'll see later that there are a lot more use for this extension. Not all of it has been implemented now, but I think there are a lot of things we can do with that. So just to give an example on, on how it can be used. Let's take this query. In this query, we have several uh, predicates. We have a predicates on the client ID in the where clause, and we have several predicates in the join clauses. So if you execute this query a certain number of times, PGQL stats will collect statistics on the predicates. We can see here that uh, after having executed this query a certain number of times, uh, we can see that uh, the predicate on command.id.client.id uh, in average, it filters out 99.99% .99 of the rows. That means that it's, it's executed um, 10,000 times as much as it should. That means an index is missing here because if you had an index there, it would be only executed once or twice. And then the interface uses this information to tell you that, well, if you want to optimize, if you want to have an index for satisfying this predicate, here are the possibilities. You can use a B3 access method or a Green access method to create an index for this column. And uh, just to give you some insight, we also look into the system catalogs, the system statistics, to see uh, the number of uh, distinct values in case, well, because if you only have two different values, it makes no sense to create an index in that. So I told you that we, only, we also sample uh, statistics about the actual values, the actual constants that are part of your query. So you can also get a view of what are the most often executed values in your query. And so if you don't know how your application works, you can get this uh, knowledge right here. And you can know that, well, in that query, 90% of the time we use the same value. What does that mean? That means that you can actually use a partial index to satisfy 90% of your queries. And uh, I don't know how you decide as a DBA to create a partial index, but getting this kind of knowledge is quite hard. How many of you are using partial indexes? One other thing we can do with that is uh, since we have uh, the different uh, values executed for the query, we can get sample plans for them. And we can actually see that we have different plans according to the different values we're using. For example, here, our query doesn't have any index or something like that. But we can see that if we are using a state equal returned, the, uh, the, um, the planner estimates that we are going to return 93 rows. Whereas if we use Another, um, another value, we, the planner will estimate that we have uh, 1,000, 100,000 rows. And as such, it makes sense to optimize for different access depending on how often the different values are used. So to glue all of that together, like I said, uh, those extensions provide only cumulative values. 
So what we need is a way to historize all of this and to be able to say, to tell exactly what happened during a certain, a certain time frame. So for this, we have a uh, power archivist. It's just a background worker, basically. It's a background worker that will just archive those data sources by periodically polling them. It's configurable, uh, the frequency is configurable, and it also automatically manages uh, the data retention policy. So let's say you just want at any given point uh, keep one week worth of statistics on your activity. And uh, the good thing is uh, I presented those extensions, but if you have a specific need and if you have other ideas of things to monitor and things you, that you want to get statistics on, you can actually extend it quite easily just by writing uh, a couple of uh, PGSQL functions. So, what is that useful for? The idea is that we are able to know where and when a bottleneck happens because since we have collected data on a specific time frame, we can actually see when the database was slow. Because as a DBA, you often get a customer or user calling and say, well, um, is there something happening with the database? It's, it's slow. And you just look at the server and no, no, everything works properly. But if you have and the history, you can actually check when there was a problem and then dig into that. Not only at a specific time, but also since the statistics are aggregated by database and by query, you can actually see what was slow. And since we provide different counters, you can see if, if the problem was, uh, I don't know, maybe the data was not in the cache anymore, maybe uh, it generated too much temp files at that point, or I don't know, but you can, dig into this information and get to the root of the problem more quickly. And after that, you, yeah, the goal of the tool is to also provide you with uh, hints on how to solve them. Um, so all of this is compatible with uh, PostgreSQL 9.4. The first version of POWA was compatible with uh, 9.3, but more limited. The reason for that is that in 9.4, uh, the query ID was exposed in PGSAT statements, so we have a way to uniquely identify queries, and so we can use the other extensions to join this information together. And on top of all of that, we have a nice graphical user interface that allows you to see all this data. Um, it's conceived on a drill down analysis uh, by basis. So just to explain a bit, the concept behind it, I'll run you through a small example. Uh, usually what happens is that there is a performance that is not satisfying on parts of an, an, uh, an application. We don't really know what or when. So we just select roughly an analysis period and then we can zoom on that and then we identify the database. So for example, we just get on the start page of the application and when we see that. And what we see is that we have a, a time where uh, something happened on the, on the database and on the cluster. And then we can get information on every, diff, every, every separate database and see which one saw the most activity. In this example, we can see that uh, we have two databases uh, that are quite active. One uh, is named Obvious and the other is EPC in that example. And so we know that maybe something <coughs> happens on those database. And the activity on the other is quite negligible, so there's not really any point in trying to optimize that. Now that we have identified which database needs to be looked, we have to drill down on it. And so we can drill down at the query level. The same way we have, we can have the number of uh, the average runtime uh, by query and in general in, on the database and then we can see the specific queries that are used on this database. So from now we can directly see that we have two queries that are taking a lot of time. One has used uh, more than one 
minutes of uh, execution time and the other uh, several seconds. And the other, all the other ones are just noise. So we instantly know on which query or analysis should focus. So once again, we can drill down on each of those queries. So in that example, our first query, the one I showed you before, if we drill on that, we can see that this query is performing a lot of access directly to the disk outside the shared buffers, but also outside the OS, the operating system uh, cache. And so we can see that spends quite a lot of time. If we zoom into that, we get to the predicates themselves. And as such, we directly have a suggestion on which index we should create to satisfy this query and to make it run faster. If we take another example, the, sec the second query, the analysis is a bit different there. What we can see here is that we have a value that is executed much more often than one another. And what is interesting is that we directly have the information that this, uh, this query we are executing much more often than the other also returns less raw. And then we can know that it's probably a good idea to create a partial index on our state column because we are constantly using the same value for this column. So that's... Uh, this project has not really been presented here, so it was nice to get the basics. But what happened in uh, version 3 is that we have some nice uh, things to complement that, uh, which will a bit automate your, your work as a DBA. Uh, the first thing is there's support for uh, an extension, which is called HypoPG. And using that and everything we, we've seen uh, before, there's a support for a feature called Glo Global Index Suggestion. That is something that will analyze the whole workload of your database and suggest you a set of indexes that you should create. As far as, I'm, as, far as, I'm, as I know, most other tools can just suggest indexes for a specific query and not for your whole database load. And that's the added value of this tool. So let's just start by presenting uh, HypoPG uh, briefly. So HypoPG has been created by my colleague Julien Rouault, sitting just right here. It allows for hypothetical indexes creation. And hypothetical index is not an index. It's just a lie. It's just a lie we tell to the planner. And then we can ask him, well, what would happen if that index existed? So if you run an explain on a query, obviously not an explain analyze because that would need to really execute the query and since the index doesn't really exist, you can't run it. You can just get the plan that would be used. It allows you to see, well, um, I have a feeling that if I create that index, maybe my query will, would uh, execute it. And so you just use HypoPG to inform the planner that you would like to pretend an index exists. And then you ask it for a plan. And if your plan use your index, maybe it would be a good idea to create it. You don't have to really create your index, generate a lot of disk access, and occupy a lot of space on disk, and wait maybe several hours or days, depending on your, the size of your database. And you can actually know if it would be useful for your query. So let's say we have a table, a small table without any index. We get a query plan. We see that it will perform a six cast. But then we can just use HypoPG to create an index on to, well, to lie about telling, creating an index, and then we get another plan, and we see, wow, that's great. If I create that index, the planner would choose to use it to satisfy my query. And we can also compare the, the estimated cost to see if that would make sense to create it, if the benefit would be worth creating that index and paying the performance penalty on EML operations. So, what is that use, useful for? It's useful, it's useful to tell, well, if I create that index, will that actually be used? There's also uh, different functions to estimate what, what, uh, how much space your index would take if you were to actually create it. Because that's 
kind of a big deal sometimes. You just need to know which how much space it will use. And then you can also measure how, you, how useful it can actually be by comparing the cost of executing a query when the index doesn't exist and the cost estimated by the planner if it supposes the index exists. So this is also part of the web interface. And uh, we can know on the, when the interface proposes to create an index, it validates for you in the background that the index will be used. It runs the query without the, but it runs the explain plan, uh, sorry, without the hypothetical index. And then again with the hypothetical index. And comparing the cost, well, it's a rough estimation. And of course, it doesn't really translate to actual um, time gains because of the cost model of Postgres. But we can estimate that uh, we would maybe make the query 100 or 1,000 times faster, or maybe two times faster. And so it helps you take the, deci the decision to create the index or not, and to have a rough idea of whether it would be worth it. So building on all of that, there is an, another feature, which is uh, global optimization. Global optimization is just consists of finding the optimal set of index to add. Because you don't want to add too much indexes, because it would slow down your write operations uh, quite greatly. But you also want to make sure that most of your queries will use an index, will actually use one. So the three, the three main things we are looking for is, well, create index that will satisfy every query, at least every query that is worth uh, using an index for, creating uh, the minimum set of indexes. And for that, we will have to privilege uh, multicolon indexes because Often you can use a multicolon index for satisfying different kind of queries. Uh, if you only use um, the first colon of your index, your multicolon index can still be used. So the algorithm is quite simple, in fact. Using what was historized uh, using PGQL stats, we find the predicates, but we are not interested in every predicate. We are, use, we are interested only in predicates that are used as part of a sex scan, because if your predicate is already using an index, there's no point in creating an, an index for that. We also want predicates that filter more than a certain number of lines out. I mean, if you have, uh, maybe, if your table is really small and uh, your table has only 100 rows, and uh, your, your predicate uh, will filter 40 of them, there's not really any point in creating an index on that. And more importantly, we are interested in predicates filtering more than a certain percentage of the lines out. Because for example, if you have a Boolean colon and uh, it's approximately 50-50 between the, 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 the repartition of your data is approximately 50-50, there is no point in creating an index. It will never be used if you create an index on, on that Boolean colon. Once we have fetched those predicates, we group them by access methods. Uh, when I say access method, I mean vtree or gene or gist. Um, yeah, depending on what operator is used on your predicate, we are going to group them uh, that way. And then we are trying to uh, join them together and build a list of predicates that are contained by, each, by other predicates. For example, if we have those three predicates, one that is querying on both the ID and the label column, well, it contains the predicate querying only on ID, and also the predicate querying only on label. Once again, that's something that's quite difficult to tell uh, the DBA if you don't really know your application. Because if you only get a list of queries, you only see the different queries, but you're not really noticing a pattern of different columns being used, at least not easily, not without spending a lot of time analyzing the, the workload. And for each of those predicates, uh, we attribute a score to it. Uh, there are plans to, to, to allow for different uh, scoring methods. Right now, it's a number of columns that are used. And then for each node, we try to compute um, 
Well, if we create an index specifically designed to satisfy this predicate, which other predicate will be optimized in the process? For example, if we create an index on only ID, it will only serve uh, the where ID equals something predicate. If we create an index on where ID equals something and label equals something in that order, it will satisfy both this predicate and the one on only with ID. If on the other one hand, we create a predicate using the label at the first column, we will be able to satisfy the query on the label, but not the one on ID. So we're trying to explore all those possibilities. And starting with the highest scoring pass, the one that will probably satisfy the most conditions, we generate an index definition for it, and everything that, has, that, uh, that will be optimized by that, we remove some from the search space, and we look. And then we find a set of indexes. Once we have that set of indexes, we will help you validate uh, that the algorithm was correct and that the suggestions that are made are not completely stupid. And to do that, if IPOPG is available on the target database, we will create each of those hypothetical index and then run explain plan for every query that is supposed to be optimized by those indexes. And we then can tell you if such or such query will actually use that index and if it uses that index, how much performance gain can you expect? So how does that look in the user interface? You have a button, optimize this database. You just click on it and get a list of index suggestion. Oh, it's a bit small. Uh, but what we can see here is that we have first the list of indexes that are suggested and which predicates will be optimized uh, using that uh, index and how many queries, how many different queries will probably use this index. Uh, we can also see that several, uh, that sometimes we will opt only optimize parts of a predicate because the other part cannot be optimized. For example, if you have um, different data types that can't be, that, that don't have a shared access method, you don't have a way of creating an index that will satisfy both of them. But maybe if, they, if after that you create an extension like uh, Betregist or Betregin, maybe you can create an index that will be able to satisfy all of them. And then for each query, we check if the index will actually be used and how much performance gain you can expect, expect based on the cost model that was reported by the explain plan. So based on that, we still have a lot and lots of ideas on how to push that further. Uh, one, one that would actually not be really useful right now because we don't have correlated, in, correlated statistics in Postgres right now, but it's something that we can expect to have uh, at some point in the, in the future, is to be able to automatically detect correlations in your data without actually examining the data, only examining what uh, what queries are done. For example, if we know that um, we have some queries that use both the city name and the zip code, and we've noticed that on average, uh, those predicates return 10 row. And if we, on the other hand, we notice that on average, just querying the city name also returns 10 row, and just querying on the zip code also returns 10 rows, we then know that those columns are correlated. Because as you may know, there's a problem uh, it's not really a problem in, uh, in Postgres, but if we don't have statistics on correlated columns, the optimizer will estimate that the uh, condition on one column will filter maybe one percent of your rows, the other one will filter another percent, and then the optimizer will think uh, the predicate will filter one thousandth of your rows. And that's actually quite bad because that's not what your data actually looks like and it can, get, it, uh, it can lead to quite bad plans in that case. So the goal would be to just be able to determine what kind of uh, correlated statistic you have to create once we have them and uh, automate, it, automate this part without having to look at the data itself and without having a real deep knowledge about uh, the application and the, the data, data set. Um, one other plan, uh, which is uh, at least partially implemented on the collect side of things, but nothing is in the user interface now, 
is to collect statistics from PGStat user tables and so on to have uh, the ML workload statistics. So we can also ponderate whether an index would be good or not uh, depending on the right load on the table. Because if your table is almost never accessed um, in select statements but it's constantly written to, it might not make sense to create uh, too much indexes on it. Uh, one other thing is that um, there's no logic to suggest partial indexes. We provide you a lot of data to make that uh, dec decision easier than before, than when you had none. But nothing is directly suggesting you to create a partial index. You still have to look at the data and make the decision for yourself and use your brain for that. And um, it would be good if the tool could allow you to turn your brain off sometimes. Um, so everything I talked about, uh, well, except PGStat statements, which is part of Postgres Contrib, uh, the rest are, um, are available on uh, GitHub uh, as public repository. And uh, there's a lot of documentation on the web too. We try to make it easy to install and we hope we'll be able to provide packages for uh, various Linux uh, systems soon. And um, yeah, the fact is, if you want to use POA, you only really have to use POA archivist and PGStat statements and the web interface. Otherwise, there is no, not much sense in, uh, in using that. But everything else is optional. So that means you can finely tune which uh, performance hit you're willing to take to have uh, a better detail uh, analysis. Um, and one of the things that most of those uh, extensions uh, can be used without uh, the Power Archivist tool, and like maybe you can find a use for them on your own without relying on the whole machinery. So I'm a bit early, so that leaves almost yeah ten minutes for questions. Seven, eight. So if you have some, yeah. Um, well, um, from the last time we measured it, we would expect uh, approm approximately one person for each extension. Uh, the fact is, PG Qualstats can be much, much more resource hungry. So to compensate for that, we, because since we're not uh, collecting statistics on queries, but on predicates that makes, uh, we have a lot of statistics to keep track of. So to even that out, there's a way to provide, uh, if there is an option to limit the sampling. So maybe you just want to analyze the predicate of one query out of 10,000 or something like that. So you can actually configure that to reduce the overhead. And uh, most of that can also be turned off. So you don't pay anything until you want to actually turn it off. You just need to change the configuration parameter, reload Postgres, and you can leave it activated for maybe an hour or so, and turn it off, and then fire your web interface to see what happens. Another question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, only use a current session, and only for explain. If you run any kind of query, or even an explain analyze, uh, it won't be used at all because it's not a real one. It's so only for... What? Uh, you only use... Uh, yep. You have a function, IPOPG create index, and you give it the DDL, and um, it returns you a generated name for the index that will be used internally and that you can then check in the plan to see if it would be actually used. And then if you want to get rid of it in your session, you have also IPOPG drop index to get rid of that. But it's also, all of this is just local to your session and it won't impact the rest of your system in any way. And it doesn't consume any resource to create, it's just an entry in the system catalog for planning purposes. Um, 
No, uh, the, the data is actually stored uh, directly on the same database. Uh, that, that's a choice we made to implement the collect, uh, the, uh, the actual collection uh, using a background worker, but uh, nothing really prevents you from um, implement, uh, for, yeah, nothing really prevents you from having a different uh, implementation for Pora Archivist, which would be maybe launched by a cron job or something like that, that would pull the data and send it elsewhere. The goal was to have something that is quite tightly integrated and uh, that is autonomous. Uh, one other thing that I didn't mention is that the web interface uh, allows you to uh, configure a list of servers that you want uh, that you want to be able to monitor that way. So you don't have to run a different web interface for every cluster. You can just have one and then you choose when you connect, you choose which cluster you want to connect to and uh, you can see the statistic at that. I think that would be possible, but right now it's not uh, it's not implemented. Uh, with with a small caveat, uh, which is we when we suggest things uh, with regards to relations and things like that, we actually store the OID. So if you if you store that on another cluster, you would still have to connect to the original cluster to resolve the OIDs to names. Uh, there's an option to do that in PGQL stats automatically. But uh, we don't use it uh, as part of the collection process because there is too much overhead in uh, resolving uh, every OID at that point. But if you're willing to pay that price and uh, be able to extract directly the names uh, that way, there's an option to do that. Other questions? No? Well, thank you for your time and I uh,